Thank you, Lena. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Can you all wave at me? Let me know you're here. Oh, it's been such um, so much fun to just connect and reconnect um, with so many of you guys. And yes, there is something really stirring. I don't know. Can you feel that God is stirring something up here um, about what is going on and just um, another opportunity in this transition process as our two churches become one. Um, we are going to invade the kingdom of darkness and expand the kingdom of light, right? That's what we're doing. And so um, it's been so awesome that that's already started. Um, but yeah, it's coming in a little over a month. We're going to be together, and I'm so excited about that. So for anyone that maybe I haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Renee, Pastor Renee Hidalgo, and my husband and I, there's my husband up there. Isn't he cute? He's from Mexico. Um, we are the pastors at Sea Life, and um, we're just expectant for what God is going to do. So, okay, Pastor Rod was here about a month ago. How many of you guys were here when he was here? Okay, so he was trying to brainwash y'all, okay? He came... And he said that he was going to be the favorite Hidalgo. And I said, not on your life, Buster. No, you're not. So I am here today to become your favorite Hidalgo. And um, I have some, some fun stuff up here. So, you know, like, I mean, none of you guys would play poker, I'm sure. But, like, allegedly, if you played poker, you know, like, if you, if you bet... You say, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know this, but I'm just, you know, imagining um, from movies or something. But, you know, like if someone bit, uh, bet something and then you, like, see them and then you raise them, right? You get what I'm saying? So when Rod came, he brought donuts from Carol Lee in Blacksburg, which are the, the world's best donuts ever. So I'm going to see him the donuts and I'm going to raise him T-shirts, okay? So, Mr. Larry, can you come and uncover my top secret table? Um, and I'm going to need some help. So Larry and Emily, would you help me? And maybe Christy. Um, we have donuts. So um, y'all can pass out donuts um, while I'm talking. So I'm going to see him the donuts. And I'm going to raise him t-shirts because some of y'all have asked for some Sea Life t-shirts. And so after church today, you can come up and get a Sea Life t-shirt. Okay. So please tell me I'm your favorite Hidalgo. Please. Okay. I can't wait to tell him. So, um, yes, thank you. And if we don't have, um, I have a whole bunch of different sizes of t-shirts, but if we don't have your size, I have a sign up. You write your name down and your size and I will get you a t-shirt, okay? I am serious about this being the favorite business. Um, so don't drop those donuts, Larry. Those are like gold, okay, Carolee donuts. So these guys are going to pass out a donut um, while we get started today. And yes, I am not above bribery at all. So here we go. Um, okay, so we are going to play a little game to get started um, as you all are getting donuts, okay? Uh, is, it, is it okay to play a game in church? Like, is it okay to have some fun? Because if not, like, I'm doomed, okay? So we're going to play a little game, and I promise that there's a point to this. I promise that it has something to do with the message, with the scripture. But um, I'm going to show you some pictures that are really zoomed in, okay? And you're going to try to guess what these pictures are, okay? Now, don't blurt it out, okay? I have to say that to my kids. Don't blurt it out, okay? You're going to look at the picture, and then I'm going to say one, two, three, and then you're going to say what you think it is, okay? Does everyone get that? We're a lot of smart people in here. Okay, we get that. Here we go. So can you throw up that first picture, Kaylee? Okay, take a look at this picture. And on the count of three, it's, it's a zoomed in picture. I want you to tell me what you think this is. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. No, who said sponge? Yes, you are right. That is a sponge. Go ahead and throw up the, yes. Okay, you see, okay, we're, we got one. Okay, next picture. Go ahead and put this up here. One, two, three. What do you think it is? No. What? Who, who said that? Who said lime? Lime. It's a lime. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, next one. What is this? What? Oh. Uncooked spaghetti. Yes. 
It's uncooked spaghetti. There we go. Okay, number four. We got seven. Okay, number four. What's this? No, y'all, no. This is a vegetable. This is a carrot. Yes, this is a carrot. There we go. Okay, next one. Number five. What is this? I stumped you all. This is chocolate. Yes, this is chocolate. Very good. Okay, we got two more. Next one. What is this? Tang oh, close. It's an orange. Yes, an orange. There we go. Yes. Okay. And last but not least, what is this? Honey. Yes. Very good, Barbara. Very sweet. Okay. So, did everyone get a donut that wanted a donut? Larry, you cannot eat the rest of those, okay? I told my Jazzy that I'd bring her one, so. <laughs> oh, oh, they didn't get any donuts in the sound booth. I'm sorry. Kaylee and Steve are having a fit back there. Okay. Okay. So how many of you got all of the pictures right? Did anyone get all of them right? Okay. How many of you got like six? There were seven. How many of you got six? Y'all, how many got five? Okay. Well, we're not going to go any lower than that because I don't want to embarrass you on my first Sunday, right? Um, okay. What I want to talk about today um, from the scripture, I want to talk about the fact that we don't always see the whole picture. Okay. We don't always see the whole picture. Does it ever bother you um, as human beings that we just have limitations, right? Like we just have limitations. That, I, that just like bothers me, right? Like I wish that wasn't true. But as we get older, right, we realize that we either have to make peace with our limitations or we can just be constantly frustrated, right? That's no fun. Um, but one of our limitations is that we cannot see the whole picture, most of the time, the whole picture of our lives, the whole picture of what God is doing. We don't always see the whole picture. And I want to look at a section in the book of Acts today, um, three different snapshots that happen right in a row, like boom, 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 to the Apostle Paul. And I want to look at how he responded to this fact that we do not see the whole picture, okay? So is that good? You guys with me? You had your donuts, okay, so you should be awake. Let that sugar high. Don't, don't crash on me. So we're going to look um, at the Apostle Paul. We have our guy, Paul. Um, Paul's life had been radically changed, right, when he met Jesus. He went from terrorist, murderer, right, to passionate missionary, okay? So his life had been completely changed. We're going to pick up at the end of Acts chapter 15 and into Acts chapter 16 today. So if you want to open... Um, your Bible up. If you want to scroll on your phone on the Bible app, we're going to be in Acts 15 and 16. And at this point in Paul's life, he had already completed his first missionary journey. Okay. So he had one trip under his belt. Okay. So he had finished his first missionary journey. And the first snapshot that I want to look at is right before he's ready to go on his second journey. So in Acts chapter 15, this is our first snapshot, verse 36. It says this, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Barnabas is his traveling companion, okay, from, from his first trip. He says, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So Paul's like, I'm ready to hit the road again, right? He's getting the, the itch to, to go back out um, on another journey, on a missionary journey. But right up front, this journey is going to start out with some unexpected conflict. Okay, everyone just say, uh, right? Uh, conflict, right? How many of us don't love conflict, right? And so this, um, this journey right up front is going to start out with some conflict. Paul and Barnabas, they had been traveling companions. They had been the best of friends and colleagues. Barnabas was the one who had taken a chance on Paul. Barnabas had loaned out his credibility to Paul when Paul was first new to the faith. But you know what? They end up in this big conflict, okay? Barnabas wants to take this guy, John Mark. He wants to, he says, we, oh, let's take him on this second trip. And Paul says, no way, Jose, right? I bet you didn't know the word Jose was in the Bible. But he says, no way, Jose. We're not taking Mark. We're not taking John Mark. Because last time we took him with us, he bailed. He bailed out on us. We're not doing this. So they get in this huge conflict. And they end up going their separate ways. Okay, 
That is not a great way to start out a missions trip, is it? No, okay. So what it says in verse 39, it says, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, went through Syria and Cilicia. Every time I read, this is, this is our first snapshot. Every time I read this, I am so tempted to pick sides. Isn't that just human nature to pick sides? I mean, if we have a football game between Virginia Tech and UVA, right, you're going to pick a side, right? Would anyone in here dare to be a UVA fan? I'm just curious. Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, where I grew up in Iowa, so um, for us, it was the Iowa Hawkeyes or the Iowa State Cyclones, okay? And Hawkeyes all the way, by the way. Um, we always have to pick a side. I mean, at the risk of, like, dividing the church, what about, like, if we were going out to eat after church and we said Moe's or Chipotle, right? How many of you be Moe's? Most people. How many of you are Chipotle? Okay, see, I'm telling you, you have to pick a side. <laughs> Um, I'm so tempted to pick a side here between Paul and Barnabas to figure out who was right and who was wrong. But one of our limitations is that we don't see the whole picture, right? And the book of Acts actually follows Paul's journey. And so, so we, you know, follow Paul's journey in the book of Acts. But don't for one minute think that Barnabas didn't have an effective ministry. Because, you know, Barnabas takes this guy, John Mark, and he, he decides to give him another chance. He takes a second chance on him. And you know what this guy, John Mark, ends up doing about 20 years later? He ends up writing the gospel of Mark, right? That's a pretty big deal. One of the most important documents in the Bible, one of the gospels, right? And so we don't see the whole picture. It, it appears that Barnabas was being faithful to what God had called him to do, right? In raising up and continuing to disciple John Mark. But he, he might have given up the spotlight of being with Paul. We don't really hear anything more about Barnabas in the scriptures, but make no mistake, he had an impact, right? And so, so we just don't always see the whole picture, and we have to be okay with that. And this is the context that Paul starts his second journey with this big conflict and this big loss, right? He loses this relationship with Barnabas. And I just want to pause. Have you ever started off something? Have you, ever, have you ever had a beginning that started off with a loss, right? That started off with this big gaping hole of where something used to be? That's where Paul is right now in this first snapshot. Okay, snapshot number two. Paul um, heads north and then he heads west, okay? Okay. It says, Paul came to Derby and then Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. Um, the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, spoke well of Timothy, and Paul wanted to take him along on his journey. Okay, so Paul ends up going on this journey without Barnabas, right? He, he picks Silas, and he ends up going. Um, can you throw up the map up there? Is anyone a map nerd? I'm a map nerd. You will find that out about me, like, basically in every sermon I show a map, because I'm a map nerd. But... This shows you where um, Paul was going. It says he went to Derby and then to Lystra. Now, Lystra, he actually had been there before. He actually went there on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. And you know what happened in Lystra? People tried to worship him as a god. And, and Paul was like, no, like, no, I'm not having that. Well, then they turn on him and they decide to drag him outside the city and stone him, right? So he didn't have a great time in Lystra, right? The majority of the people there um, thought that they had succeeded in stoning him, and they thought he was dead. So imagine when he shows up again, like, hey, guys, I'm back, right? And, and he's right there. And so right here in this snapshot, Paul ends up meeting someone. He ends up meeting this young disciple named Timothy. Now, t tradition says that Timothy was between 16 and 20 years old at the time. Is there anyone in here that's between 16 and 20? Come on, raise, I know y'all don't want to raise your hand, but I'm going to, yeah, thank you, Miss Fraun. I love you. <laughs> um, he, he was young. He was young. You don't have to wait for some magical day to be used by God, right? Like God, now is the time. And, and Timothy, at a young age, had a reputation. It said that the people in the city spoke well of him. So I want you just to think about this and put the pieces together for just a minute. How in the world 
did Timothy become a follower of God at such a young age, a committed disciple? How did he become a committed disciple at such a young age? Well, remember, Paul had been in Lystra, right? It, there's no indication that he met Timothy on his first trip. But you know what? I bet he planted some seeds in that area, right? And do you think Paul ever wondered, man, I don't think it was even worth going to Lystra. I mean, I got dragged out of the city and stoned. But, you know, maybe I should have avoided that place altogether. But you know what? Somewhere some seeds had been planted and had taken root. And now he's seeing the fruit of some of those seeds. And even later, it says that the other factor in Timothy becoming such a committed disciple at a young age were two special women in his life, his mom and his grandma. Paul says to Timothy later in his life, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And now I'm persuaded also lives in you. I wonder how his mom and grandma found out about Jesus right? Probably on that first missionary journey when seeds were planted in the area of Lystra. This, guys, this was, the gospel was going out for the first time in these days. This was shortly after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And so Timothy becomes this committed disciple. Paul would have had no idea that this was going to happen because we don't see the big picture, right? And, his, and Timothy's mom and grandma investing in him, they would have no idea the impact that Timothy is going to have throughout Scripture and in spreading the gospel. And so I don't want you to miss this because the, the relationship with Timothy, this relationship with Timothy or Paul, it came out of a place of deep loss. You see that? There was a gaping hole because of the loss of relationship with Barnabas. And that made room for this relationship with Timothy. And I actually dislike that very much. I want to tell you why. The, the loss of Barnabas made space for Timothy. But I dislike that in a way because it makes, it makes the loss feel kind of cheap, right? It makes the loss almost as if like, I'm just dismissing it. Well, you know, in the pain that came with it. It's like, well, you know, um, it wasn't that big a deal because something good came out of it. And I, I just, I dislike that it cheapens it. It feels like it cheapens it. And a couple years ago um, at Sea Life, we actually did a whole sermon series on the topic of grief. And that grief looks different for every single person. And the timeline of grief looks different. And with loss comes grief. But what I want us to see is that in our grief, we can look for God to work in unexpected ways if we will realize that, that we don't see the big picture, but we can trust the one who does. And that is how this relationship with Timothy, there was space for it because of a loss. And sometimes we're afraid of finding blessing in our grief. Sometimes we're afraid of that because it, we think that filling up that empty space with something new means that we're replacing whoever or whatever we've lost. But, but that's not true. No one could replace Barnabas in Paul's life. Barnabas was the first one that took a chance on Paul. But at the same time, after this loss, God does something. He raises someone up to fill some of that space. And this relationship between Timothy and Paul becomes so beautiful. That will become like the most important relationship in Paul's life. And I just want to say, I just want us to see here that Paul was open to, to realize he didn't see the whole picture. He didn't know why that happened with Barnabas. He didn't know how that was all going to work out, right? He didn't see the big picture, but he trusted the one who does, right? And we, we can do that. We can do that too. I mean, before we move on to the last snapshot, is there any loss in your life maybe? Is there any loss? Is there any places of emptiness? And through the pain, could God maybe saying to you, 
to trust him, that even in loss, he can bring blessing. He can bring a gift to you. It doesn't deny the pain. It doesn't cheapen it. But can we, can we trust the one who does see the big picture? So what happens here? Snapshot number three is that Paul goes on. He ends up taking Timothy with him, okay? And it says in verse 6 of Acts chapter 16 that Paul and his companions, so his companions would have been Silas and Timothy, they traveled throughout this region of Phrygia and Galatia, and it says they had been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. They were kept by the Holy Spirit. They he, Basically, God said, no, you're not going to go there. And so then they came to the border of this other place, Mysia, and they tried to enter a place called Bithynia. And it says the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go there either. Okay, throw that map up there again. Here we go, map. This is interesting. Okay, Paul wanted to go to Asia. Why? He wanted to preach the gospel, right? That seems like a pretty noble cause, right? He wanted to go to Asia, and God said, no, you're not going to go there. Okay, so that might have been disappointing or frustrating, but Paul obeys, right? So then he wants to go to this place called Bithynia. And again, God says, actually, no, you can't go there either. I mean, can you imagine that? Has God ever told you no? Has God ever said no to you? Like, please raise your hand if God's ever said no to you. Okay, um, yeah, we don't like to be told no, do we? I don't like to be told no, Um and God doesn't even explain himself here. He doesn't even say, okay, Paul, you can't go to Asia because X, Y, Z. You can't go to Bithynia because, you know, this or that. He just says no. He just says you can't do it. And see, Paul, he was smart enough to realize that he didn't see the whole picture, right? That, that God, even though conveniently God doesn't tell him why, he accepts no from God. That is super hard, okay? That is super hard. How do you respond when God says no to you? Okay, it's a little quiet in here. Like, okay, I'm still the favorite, right? Please. How do you respond when God says no, even when he doesn't explain why? Do you shut down? Do you push ahead anyway? That's not a great idea, by the way. I, I've done that. <laughs> There's no indication that Paul tried to force his own way. He accepted God's answer. And see, my job is obedience. It's not to always understand why. Because we don't see the big picture. Okay? And just because God says no this is what I found. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan, okay? Imagine that. I mean, that's a big revelation to me. It should be obvious, but just because God says no to something, it doesn't mean he's up there like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do now, right? He has a plan. Imagine that. And I want you to see God had a plan here for Paul. Verse 9 says, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help him. So after Paul saw this vision, he basically concluded that God had called them to preach in Macedonia, right? It's not that God didn't have a plan. That, that's the whole point. God did have a plan, after all. You know, imagine that. Um, but we've seen Paul lean in through loss. We've seen him trust that God sees the bigger picture. Now we've seen him ex um, accept a no from God without explanation. And you know what happens in Macedonia? Um, definitely you should read the rest of Acts chapter 16 this week, okay? Am I allowed to give homework? Like, am I still going to be the favorite if I give you homework? <laughs> Probably not, but read the rest of Acts chapter 16 this week, okay? That you would um, see what God does. Let me just give you an abbreviated version. Basically, Paul and his guys, they go over to Macedonia. When they cross um, the Aegean Sea, throw up that next, that next map. When they cross the sea over to Macedonia, they end up in a, a city called Philippi. When they cross the sea, do you know what? They're crossing into a whole new continent. This, they're crossing over into what we know today as the continent of Europe, right? 
And so they cross over here and they go to Philippi. And Paul's normal strategy is that he's going to go to the synagogue and he's going to start there on the Sabbath. But guess what? In Philippi, there was no synagogue. So, okay, we have to improvise. What are we going to do? And it says that Paul and his companions, they go down to the river and there just happens to be a group of women down at the river. And verse 13, it says, on the Sabbath, he went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down, we began, to, we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. You know, this doesn't sound maybe like a huge deal to us, but, but this was not how things were done in those days, right? Women did not have status or influence, right? So if you're gonna try to start a brand new work in a brand new city on a brand new continent, it's not all that strategic to go to a group of women down by the river right? That, that's not like what you would like textbook church growth, right? That's not what you would do. But Paul knew he didn't see the whole picture. So he does what he can with the opportunity that's in front of him. And I want you to see this because one of the women in that group turns out to be a lady named Lydia. She is a businesswoman. And she actually did have some status and influence in those days, which was rare. And it says, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and the members of her household were baptized. What in the world? Okay, Lydia and her family, they become the first people in the whole continent of Europe that came to Christ, that came to accept this gospel, this good news. And the gospel then began spreading throughout Europe. And see, God closed some doors for Paul along the way. He said no to this and no to that. But then he opened up a door for a whole continent. Do we see that? Paul could not have known that was going to happen. But what he did know is that he didn't know everything, right? He didn't see everything. And so he chose to trust the one who does. And that's just, that was what I want to get across to us today, that when we accept our limitations that we simply can't see the whole picture most of the time, not only can we trust the one who does, but we can start to cooperate with him. And I want us to see that we can start to cooperate. Are you cooperating with God in your life? You know, sometimes like Paul, it's through loss or conflict. And I dislike that. I didn't write the Bible, right? I dislike that part. But Paul cooperated through a deep loss. Or sometimes it's through accepting a no. You know, some, some of us have this thing where we don't take no for an answer. Well, that doesn't work out too well when the one telling you no is God, okay? Are we cooperating with God when he says yes and when he says no? Sometimes it's cooperating with God even when something seems insignificant like talking to this random group of women down by the river, right? We don't see the big picture that God used that small opportunity and expanded the gospel onto a whole new continent. Are you cooperating with God in your life? And I just, in this whole transition um, with our churches and with Oasis and, and Sea Life, I have so appreciated the heart of this church to cooperate with God in this process to really try to discern, okay, what is God saying? What is he saying right now? And, and how can we cooperate with what God is doing? And I want you guys to know just from the very depths of, of our hearts that, that Rod and I are truly trying to do that as well, to come before God and say, we don't see the whole picture here, right? Like we don't see the whole picture. But God, what are you doing in this season? What are you saying? And we will cooperate with you. And, and we have tried to, to do that. You know, there are so many things that we are so excited about in this, this transition, in this new season. Um, but there's also been some things that have been hard, right? I'm sure there have for you. There have been for us. And things that there have been maybe some bumps in the road. There'll probably be a few more speed bumps, right? in the road where things that we've just had to accept the fact that we don't see the whole picture. We don't fully see, God, what you're doing yet, but we trust you 
We accept when you say yes, and we accept when you say no. And more than anything, we want to cooperate with what you're doing. And I felt this so strongly that I, I wanted to share this as I, as I get ready to close, that for Paul to get this right, there was a whole continent at stake. Do you see that? There was a whole continent at stake for him to get this right. And I absolutely know, I absolutely know that if we can get this transition right, not perfect, we won't get it perfect, but if we can get it right, that there is so much at stake. There are lives of your friends and neighbors and my friends and neighbors and people in this city in this valley that are watching. Eternities are at stake. There is a whole campus of college students that are desperate. Some of them don't even know they're desperate. Some of them know how desperate they are, and they don't know where to turn. And that's at stake because we can reach them. And, and there's so much at stake. There are businessmen and businesswomen in this city that are looking for purpose, right? That, that just earning more money is, I mean, that's never going to be fulfilling enough, right? There are, there are um, teenagers at stake. My, both of my girls are in the middle school. My son is in the elementary school. There are teenagers that need to know Jesus. Like, this is terrifying to think about, but the teenagers that we know today, in five or 10 years, they're going to have babies and be parents, okay? We got to reach them now so that they're going to raise our babies and my grandkids to love Jesus. That's a lot at stake, right? So for Paul, there was a whole continent at stake, and I believe that we can get this transition right. We don't see the big picture. Rod and myself don't even pretend that, like, we can see this whole big picture, right? But we are willing to say yes. We're willing to cooperate with God as we go along the way. And so I want to invite on if Scott or Larry want to come up and just pl um, play a little bit because I want to just invite us to respond, invite us to pray this morning. Would you go ahead and stand with me at this time? And would you just, would you just close your eyes for just a minute? <clears throat> and I just want to give you a moment with Jesus this morning. And I just want you to just ask him maybe where you have, have tried to control. Maybe you've not been willing to accept the fact that you don't see the whole picture, right? Maybe that's hard to accept. Maybe you're grieving a loss today. And that's hard to see the big picture in that. Or maybe God has said no to you about something, and that is just painful. Or maybe you feel like the thing in front of you that he's given you to do is so small and so insignificant. Like, this could never matter. This could never make a difference. And God is saying, just watch. Just watch. You have no idea. And so, God, I just thank you today for your word. I thank you for this reminder. Just as we look at these different scenes from the Apostle Paul, I thank you for the reminder that you are a big God and you can see the whole picture. You see the whole, um, the whole picture of what you are doing in this season, in our lives individually, in our families, in this church, in this transition, in this city, in this valley. God, you are doing something, and we see but a small part, and you see the whole thing. And so, God, I just want to um, exhort my brothers and sisters today that we would cooperate with you, that we, you have a plan, and that we would cooperate with you, that we would cooperate and trust. And God, I thank you that we are never more safe or never more secure than in that place where we're trusting you and cooperating with you. And God, we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen.